<laughs> no, you know, what's funny is um, you think about for months what it's going to be like in that first time you say something, when you first speak, in that first opportunity to make a, a first impression. And every one of those words that I had lined up just left me. <laughs> so here we go. This is it. Um, as a way of introduction, just want to say, hi. My name is Barry. I'm your pastor. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You guys have been so kind to both me, especially to my family, and we are just looking forward to many, many days, years ahead, that we can journey with you, alongside of you, here at Lakeside Community Church. So exciting, so exciting. A couple of housekeeping items, just because it looks different, and so I want to address that. And number one is, um, I come with my own pulpit, and so, uh, preacher, have pulpit, will travel, and <laughs> I know my parents are going to be listening to this, and my in-laws, but this pulpit, and so a shout out to my dad, uh, Reverend Bruce Kennard, he's retired, but uh, he made me this way back in the day, and a uh, little plaque here, 2006, I guess, 13 years ago, that's not way back in the day, it just... <laughs> When you're raising teenagers, it just feels like it. So, um, so yeah, so this is, I like to use this. And uh, second thing is, this is the Broncos, but it's not Boise State. It is uh, Denver. And uh, I don't have anything Nebraska yet. And I'm sure somebody can help me take care of that. Yeah. This, so I just want you to know this isn't Boise State. So it is Denver. Um, I grew up in Colorado, and so I'm a, I'm a, big Bronco fan. Today, I want to tell you about a, a journey, and it was probably, it was almost eight months ago to the day that my family and I started on a journey, a faith journey, a journey that would stretch us, a journey that would change us. It was a journey that would cause us to come together, a journey that would... Uh, some days just want us to not be around each other, too. Um, but it was a journey that God was calling us to. And it was one of excitement. It was one of uncertainty. But we knew God was saying, this is what we want you to do. This is where we want you to go. Um, so my family and I had just sold our house. And we put all of our belongings into storage. And we purchased a travel trailer. And we purchased a truck to pull that travel trailer. And the five of us set out on a journey uh, to go from Nampa, Idaho, to a town on the east coast, on the Atlantic seaboard, in Florida, called Melbourne. It's, uh, it's in the Panhandle, just below Kennedy Space Center, about right in the middle, for a frame of reference. It was winter, and so we didn't take the most direct route. We kind of felt a little bit like the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. We wandered across the United States. We went down south, and we uh, went straight south through Utah into Vegas, Grand Canyon into Phoenix, across New Mexico, saw some amazing things, the Grand Canyon, Carlsbad Caverns, saw God's beauty in nature. And then we saw West Texas. <laughs> Ooh, God. You got to make the good with the bad. So I apologize if you're from West Texas, but man. Um, traveled across Texas for what seemed like 40 years. <laughs> and then uh, across Louisiana into uh, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and down to Orlando. And when we were in Orlando, we had the privilege of being able to live in our camper for uh, eight months. It wasn't so bad, really, uh, in the beginning, because, you know, it was winter. 
Okay, winter in Florida versus winter here, I know, are going to be totally different. But it wasn't that bad. I mean, it was comfortable. I think the first week or two, we might have actually turned on the heat a couple times. Um, but that quickly stopped. And uh, then the humidity kicked in. So, you know, when you live in a metal box in Florida, that, that doesn't do well. But we lived on the church property, and the church was uh, a church where we began to serve with some friends that we met in seminary. And we had the opportunity, God then used us to work with that church, to work with the Compassionate Ministry Center that they were with, that, that were partnering with the church there. Uh, we were able to work with students from Florida Institute of Technology, a big international school. We were able to work with Chinese students who were learning English as a second language. There were other people in the church that were leading Bible studies with um, some Muslim ladies um, as they were wanting to learn about the Bible. And, and as they followed the Quran, they were wanting to learn what the Bible was. Um, we worked with homeless. We worked in an area that was very poor. And we loved every minute of it. And through that journey, God was just telling us, I'm in control. Now, Crystal and I, over our 20 plus years of ministry and 26 years of marriage, we have many faith journeys, many faith stories. And each and every time, we know God has been faithful. And God has seen us through and God has changed us and shaped us in amazing ways. And so today, I just want to talk about faith. And then I want to leave us at the end of the sermon. I just want to leave it with a, a faith prayer. A prayer that I have for Lakeside Community Church. Uh, just a hope, a challenge, if you will, for us. This is a great church. Long history. Chris and I have marveled at the fact of just our connections with this community of faith from 20 years ago through, through some of your children that came through Mid-America as we worked there. Um, it's a great place. And we're glad to be here. So if you will, um, if you'll stand and, and uh, honor the reading of God's word, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 and verses 8 through 16. On the screen, you're going to have the New International Version. I know that is the version that you've been comfortable with. That's what Dr. John preached from normally. So you can read along. NIV is going to be on the screen. One of the things that I like is the New Living Translation. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. It doesn't retranslate it. It doesn't uh, change any of the words that are say, said. But it just says it in a, in a way that, uh, that feels comfortable to hear orally as it's spoken. So as you read along, you probably have the NIV. You can read up here on the NIV. I want you to hear the New Living Translation as I read from that. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3 and then 8 through 16. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that we hope for is go that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. God gave his approval to people in days of old because of their faith. And by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. And down to verse 8. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in a tent. And so did Isaac and Jacob, to whom God gave the same promise. Abraham did this because he was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that Sarah, together with Abraham, was able to have a child, even though they were too old and Sarah was barren. Abraham believed that God would keep his promise, 
And so a whole nation came from this one man, Abraham, who was too old to have any children. A nation with so many people that like the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. All these faithful ones died without receiving what God had promised them. But they saw it all from a distance and they welcomed the promises of God. They agreed that they were no more than foreigners and nomads here on earth. And obviously people who talk like that are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had meant the country they had come from, they would have found a way to go back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a heavenly city for them. The word of our Lord. You may be seated. What is faith? It starts out right here in the scripture, the, the confidence of something that's unseen. When you're in the church, faith is one of those words that we talk about. And we seem to think we should automatically know what it is. But when you come to live it and you come to practice it, you know, what is it? What is faith? How do you describe that to someone who is not part of the church, who has no upbringing, who hasn't grown up in these walls? How do you tell them what faith is in our context? Well, we know of believing without seeing. We can say it's knowing without proof. I know some of you are from Missouri, the show me state. <laughs> you just got to believe. Can't show you. It's confidence without the tangible the thing that you can, you can touch. It is the going. It is the doing without the security of knowing where you're going or what you're doing. And then it's just this assurance that you have of what you hope for. So the writer of Hebrews just tells us we have this assurance. You know, there's a difference between faith and trust. If I were to take this stool, and I think my faith's being a little tested right now, honestly, as I look at it, but <laughs> I can touch it, I can feel it, and I can trust that when I sit on this, it's not going to break. <laughs> Bad object lesson if it did. <laughs> but it's something that I know is going to work. I know what its function is. I know what its purpose is. And so I can trust it's going to do its, its purpose. It's the same thing that when you get into your car and you push the, the ignition button or you turn the ignition switch, you trust and know that it's going to start. You trust and know that when you touch your brakes, you're going to stop. And you're trusting these things because you become familiar with them that you become used to them and, 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 and it feels comfortable. But faith is a little more than that. Faith is that moment where you just have to step out and believe. You have to step out and say, wow, I don't know how this is going to work. Or I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You're at your wit's end. There's a movie in the Indiana Jones series, the third one, probably the best one, that they're searching for the Holy Grail. And in that movie, he goes through a series of tests at one point to, to avoid booby traps as a protection of the Grail. And he comes to this chasm, and he comes to this, this opening in, in, a, in a cliff wall, and he sees the other side in the opening of where the Grail is. But as he looks, it just is an infinite drop. And he can't tell where he's going to go or how he's going to get across. But the clue he reads, it says, in a step of faith or a leap of faith from the lion's mouth. And he's trying to figure it out. He doesn't know what else to do, but you see him just kick his leg up step forward. You think he's going to fall. 
there's nothing there. He can't see it. But he's expressing that faith. He stops. It catches him. It looks like he's floating in midair. It looks like this amazing supernatural event. But then the camera pans to the side. And at just the right angle, you can see that it's a land bridge. Blended in, looks like the opposite wall. And it's just a little narrow thing. Throw some dirt on it and he walks across. But it was that first step of the unknown that had to be something in faith. The difference between faith and trust, once he stepped, once he knew it was there, once he picked up the dirt and he threw it across, and then it became trust. Okay, I'm going to trust that this doesn't fall. It's connected. Others have walked across it. It's here. But it was that first moment when something became real. And so today we talk about those moments when things become real to us as a church, as a body of believers, when we, when we step out and we say, okay, God, we're going to do this. For me and my family, it was eight months ago. We said, okay, God, we're going to do this. It's going to become real. Wow. God made a way. Now, I know some of you have done strength finders, and there are all sorts of assessments out there, and one of the new assessments is an assessment called Enneagram. And if any of you are familiar with the Enneagram, it's a number system that talks about your personalities, and it gives you a number. I happen to be an Enneagram 6. That means probably nothing to most people. But as a 6, what it means is... Um, I like security. I want to feel secure. I want to feel supported by others. I need to have the certitude and the reassurance. I need to uh, uh, test the attitudes of others. And it really becomes a moment where, where really you, you begin to fight insecurities because you need to know. It's like, I need to know that this is here. Faith journeys are a challenge for sixes. I know the stories, and I can trust God because he's, because he's been there before. But maybe you're like me, and when you go to step out, and maybe you're not a six, it doesn't matter what you are, but maybe you're that person that just simply says, God, I can't move in that first step. I need to know that you're real. I need to know what you have for us. It's that story here in Abraham where he talks of pulling Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldeans and he, and he takes him on his journey. Abraham didn't know where he was going, but he knew the promise. And that's what we have. And so today we need to ask ourselves, well, how big is our God? I mean, do you have a God that you uh, put in a tiny little box and maybe you put him on a bookshelf in your house? And then you can just every now and then, you can, you can be going along and, oh, let me check on God. And so I go over here and, oh, God's still there. Okay. You fit him in your pocket. Is it, is it small? Or is your God so massive that you can't contain him? It talks about this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, where he talks about what God did. And it talks about creation, that here you have this God and by faith, we understand the universe was formed at God's command. And what we see now did not come from anything that can be seen. God took, and the reference to the Genesis story in chapter 1 of Genesis in the first several verses, and he, and he goes through this story where God created everything. The Latin would be ex nihilo. There's, there's a word you can write down and look at, but it just means from nothing. And then God created what we have out of nothing. I mean, just think about that. We can go through the, all these debates and we can go through these stories of saying, you know, was it a big bang or... Sure, God created the big bang. It started from nothing. God created it. We know God did it. The earth 
was created by him. The skies were created by him. The stars were created by him. The sun, the moon, water, earth, dry land, plants, seed-bearing fruits, animals. It was all created by God. And by faith we know that. We see it. And we, and we understand. And so we have this hope of just saying, if God can do that, then God can do anything. God can do anything. And so we have this hope that even though when we ask these questions of when will I know if I have enough security or what does that security even look like? Because we're living in a world that is always changing. It will always change. It is going and moving. And by nature, this world becomes uncertain. But we can be courageous. And we can have peace in any circumstance. But the challenge becomes that moment where we don't have faith or have enough faith, or maybe we've even lost faith. And there are stories all throughout the Old Testament where that has happened. Where the faith is challenged a little bit. And that's what we have to battle against. We have to simply say, God, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And so we find then, out of that challenge of, of reading this story on faith, of faith, the assurance of things that we have not seen, but the, but the assurance of what we're hoping for, of what God is promising, is what we can hold on to, that we can say, God, in that challenge of being weak there, our hope is found in the fact that if we're willing, if we're obedient, if we trust God in his, in his promises and step out, God will give us the good life. God will fulfill his promises. Here's a caveat in this. Abraham and Isaac... And the descendants there, they all trusted that. They all knew that. Did they live to see it? No. They didn't, they didn't actually receive it, the blessing in a way that they could, they could hold on to it. And they can say, ah, oh, this is why we did it. For the Kennard family, we, we were blessed God took care of us. God has brought us to you guys in this amazing place. But even now, we can't understand the eternal blessings or the consequences of what it took to follow him and what God wants to give us. So maybe we can have that hope and that assurance that God is going to take care of our relationships and maybe it doesn't ever turn out like we hope. That's tough. Now you begin to maybe not trust God as much as you did before. Or maybe you're trusting and hoping that if I get this new job, or if I do some of this training or a little more education, that I'll be able to do such and such, and then I can do X and Y, and Z, and I'll be set, and I'll be planned out. And then life happens, and it doesn't work out. Or you do it, and you don't get the job, or whatever. I don't want to be a downer for us today, but I want it to be a reality of just simply saying that life happens in this uncertain world. Life changes. And so our challenge is, okay, what do we do next? And the writer of Hebrews is trying to, this whole 11th chapter, and, and, and I think we're going to visit the last part of it next week. But this whole 11th chapter is, 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 is explaining for us, God's got this. God's in control. He's in charge. And so the reality becomes 
that we can die without receiving what we've been promised, what we're hoping for, but God is working for us. And so we have to sit there and say, how big is our God? And say, God, I am not ashamed of you. I am not ashamed of, of being able to, to, to say who you are. If you look in the, in the verses 8 through 16, and you look at this journey, by faith, Abram obeyed. He didn't know where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised, he lived there by faith, for he was a foreigner living in a tent. So did Isaac, so did Jacob. He gave them the same promise. And they did it because he was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. We live this life because we have this promise for the next life. We have this promise of what's going to come. We live in a world that God created, and then we understand here from verse 3, which alluded to Genesis chapter 1, and it tells us this creation story, and it was God's perfect world. But what happened was Genesis 3. In the fall of man. And so God's perfect world was changed and, and our faith has rocked a little bit. And Abraham knew this when he was looking for the city, eternal foundations built by God. And that becomes our hope and that becomes our joy that as we are following him, that we are doing more than just trusting him, but stepping out in those faith moments into the unseen and, and saying, God, I feel you calling me to do this calling me to these moments that, because you have this eternal city for me. You have this hope. I can be with you. You are going to recreate your creation. You're going to restore your creation. I may not see it. My grandmother swore she would see it before she died. She didn't. She sees it now. She knows it now. And knows that presence. And so in this world of fear, in this world of brokenness, in this world of hurt, in this world of, uh, of, that is just not like God ultimately designed it, there's still God all over it. His fingerprints are here. You're here. We're witnesses of the light. We carry that light. We go with that hope of doing this. And so as we read these passages and we simply say, God, what do you have for us here? We now kind of begin to understand what faith is. Okay, God, help us to have this faith. What do we do with that? And so I have a challenge for us here at Lakeside Community. When we think about what do we say for that first Sunday? What's the new pastor going to say to us? I have this challenge and this prayer for us. My prayer for Lakeside Community Church is threefold. And I want to live by this, and I want you to live by this. That because we have the hope and the assurance in something that isn't seen, because we have the faith in a God that can do some amazing things, that we can do more than trust we can trust him but we can do more than just trust him that this place first is a place of grace it is i'm not i'm not saying something that's going to change we have felt the grace here but we want to keep that in front of us and by saying this is a place of grace it's 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 a place where people can come as they are all the bruises all the bumps, all the brokenness. A place where people do not feel that they have to clean up, become more Christian or more worthy of coming into a church. A place where people don't have to feel like they have to clean up before they can come in these doors. This place of grace is a place where genuine hospitality, and you'll hear me talk about that. My doctoral work was on hospitality. Hospitality where genuine hospitality and love is shown to everyone. 
where people are, are drawn because of that hospitality and they see it in you and I, the kindness of Christ is shown through us because we have a relationship with Christ. Can we be a place of grace? So the second thing that I want us to be is I want us, I want us to be a place of growth. And, and, and when you hear growth, I, I don't necessarily mean numbers. I don't necessarily mean bodies. The place of growth is that place where people come as they are, but then we're a place that says, thank you for being here but we're going to challenge you. And we're going to challenge you to not stay just as you are. You can come in this door however, but we're going to talk about growth. We're going to talk about discipleship. We're going to talk about getting closer to Christ. A place where people can come as they are, but are challenged to grow and to change and not stay where they are. I want this to be a place and I covenant with you guys to be a place where the gospel is preached. The good news of Christ is preached, full of both grace and truth, and a place where we grow in every way more and more in the likeness of Christ. And if we do that, and if we are a place of grace, and we're a place of growth, and we're, we're showing the image of Christ in everything we do because of our faith in Him, then we'll, we'll grow. People will come. People will want what you have. And we do that together. And then the last thing that I pray for us is that we're a place of gospel mission. A place that recognizes every single person is created in Christ to do good works for Christ and to do the works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. Every single person. A place that equips people to reach our full redemptive potential in Christ. To our fullness of what we can be. And then a place that then sends out people on mission to bring gospel compassion and hope in the world as far as the Spirit calls us and to wherever He calls us. A place of grace, a place of growth, a place of gospel mission. Anybody can come. Anybody is welcome. Everybody is going to be challenged and we're going to grow and we're going to preach gospel truth. What a place of gospel mission that we just turn around and go. See, our job is to come into this place and breathe God in. And as we breathe God in, we can't help but be changed. We can't help but say, God, I'm going to take that step. He'll do it for us. And then we go. And we breathe God out. And we're on mission. That is our hope. That is the joy of why we come together. It's why we gather to be those people. And so we need to say, Lord, make it so. Lord, make it so. As a way of benediction, a pastor or a preacher, and I know myself will Raise their hands. A benediction being a blessing. An act of you being able to get into that blessing and receiving that blessing is to simply do something like this. Someone is giving. Someone is receiving. And so in that act, when you see me do this, this is a good action for you to do, and I want you to receive it. But our benediction today and our blessing is we have journeyed through Hebrews, the first part of Hebrews chapter 11, is found in Psalm 33, 22. So as you go this day, 
receive this blessing. Let your steadfast love, your enduring love, your never failing love, O oh Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Go in his peace. You are dismissed.